can maybe just keep a wee eye on that for me, Brian, at all. All right, so I just want to start off and look at the, the current state of play. Um, we're obviously in 2021. We've had 12 months there of lockdown. Um, hopefully we're coming through the other side of that and we'll get kids back out on the pitch fairly soon. But over the last 12 months, um, I just want to bring people up to date and sort of just fill them in as to what has been going on from a strategic point of view within the association. 2019, we had the Talent Academy Player Development Review Committee report. Um, Eugene sat on that review and um, was part of that work group, so he's going to discuss that with us this evening. Um, in October 2019, we also had the the Dairy City Five Year Strategy that was commissioned by Ulster Council. Um, I sat on that work group as well as uh, John Keenan, who chaired it. Um, that document was put together. There was a lot of really good uh, feedback into the document, and there's a lot of time put into it. At the minute, unfortunately, that document is still sitting on the shelf, and hopefully once we get things moving again and the association gets back into a better place, we can start to, to see the, the aims and objectives from that strategy come to light. 2021 to 2023, Ulster Council brought out their own strategy, sustaining clubs and building capacity. Um, and again, that's available on the Ulster Council website. I'm going to link each of these strategies into the chat function so people have access to them um, for later if they want to browse through them. And then 2021 to 2026, so over the last 12 months, I've been involved with a coaching and games group chaired by Damien Cassidy, and recommendations have been brought out around a new coaching and development strategy um, titled We Are Dairy. Um, in terms of the strategy We Are Dairy, the mission was to reflect the GA's unique ethos within our community through a sustainable support system, which promotes the highest coaching and performance standards leading to increased participation at both club and county level over a five-year period. The strategic goals, continuous development of our coaches, increased participation in Gaelic Games, closer and strengthened links between all feeder primary schools and their clubs, assistance for junior, intermediate and senior clubs towards improving playing performance, additional player pathways for junior and intermediate teams to, to elite and representative level, and anybody that was at the consultation meetings will understand that there was a proposal put together for district teams um, to give players an opportunity to represent their district and essentially play in a, in a senior club championship at senior level. Increased pool of players that can play at elite level for a county. So the thought was that with that pathway in place, the players will be exposed to a higher level of football and that would increase the, the pool, if you like, that the senior manager could pick from. Additional pathways for development of our referees. Um, again, anybody, again, that was at the consultation or has read the document will understand that there's a, there's a suggestion on it that a referees academy will be set up, um, and that will be essentially starting at Go Games um, through the Young Whistlers and providing a pathway through for referees to try and increase the amount of referees that we have available to us to officiate our games. Enhanced support systems for health and well-being of our participants. Amended uh, support structures to influence the behaviour and culture around our county teams and the implementation of the dairy, dairy study strategy that I just spoke about. So they were the main strategic <coughs> goals. Um, each of them are broke down into priorities. I think there's six um, priorities altogether in the document. And again, I'll share the document on, on the tab at the side so people can get a wee look through that to familiarise themselves with it. Just going to play this video um, that the GF put together around the player pathway. And I suppose the, the purpose, the, the reason why I'm putting this on is that all of them plans that I've just shown, the club features in the middle of all of them. And I suppose that's why I feel it's really important that Clubs start to look at their coaching structures, what's going well, what could we improve on. Um, I know the priority will be now that we get our kids back out onto the pitch, and rightly so. Um, having two kids myself at that age, I know how important it is to get them back at it. But I suppose the purpose of tonight is, is to get you thinking as a club and as a coordinator within your club about how you can make your coaching better, um, things that we might need to adapt and improve on, things that are, that are going really well, and hopefully... Um, particularly Neil's presentation later on or, or as a bit of a chat you'll come away and you'll think 
God, we're doing really well at that as a club, or that's something that 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 you know we, that might need tweaks, but something that's going really really well for us. Um, and these things are as much about you know backing up what you're doing as opposed to highlighting the things that are going wrong. Will we all get uh, club coaching plans done between now and the start of play? Most likely not. But if clubs can start to think about get kids back out when we get our games over with and we, and we progress on through our Go Games program and into our club uh, CCC fixtures, September and October we'll maybe get a group of people together and look at our club coaching structures and how we're going to move forward with that. I'm just going to play this video from um, the GAA. Hopefully it loads up for me. I think we have an issue with sound there, did we? Yeah. Yeah. Two, two seconds just to say, see if I mute myself and put this on. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, I'll also share the link in the on the sidebar. Um, share your computer signed also. Roger, good man. Wait to see if I can get that. No, I'm not sure where that is. Sorry about that. Um, I'll share the wee link and you can look through that video yourself. But um, basically, Larry McCarthy, the new GA president, uh, Michael Monod, the ladies LGFA, and um, the Camogie president have, have all sort of endorsed <coughs> their pathway from, for Gillick Games um, and what that means for placing the club at the centre um, and how ladies, Neil, uh, everybody involved in the GA family are going to be following the same pathway. Um, and that was launched just last week. And that leads me into Eugene's presentation then um, around the, the work that his committee had done. So I'll just share, introduce Eugene, and if, I'll just share your screen, Eugene. Have you got control there now, Eugene? Not yet, Chris. Uh, can you request control there? And 
Uh, no, I don't. I can't uh, see. Doesn't give me the option to request it. I could share it from this end. Needs be. If you share again, Chris, you seem to have unshared there. If you share again, you should probably be able to request control. Okay, yeah. Get control to. Yeah. Put, you put my first slide up, Chris, and then I'll get control. There you go. I think that should be United. Right, yes, Chris. Can you can you put the the uh, can you put the slide up for slide? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's set up now. Now, the only thing is I don't have control. <clears throat> I can scroll across if that makes it any easier, Eugene. I, I'll just tell you to hit the button, Chris, and you move it on. Is that all right? Yeah, no problem, yeah. All right, good job. All right, so I'm going to keep people waiting. So listen, first of all, everybody, I'm assuming everybody's in the belly, and uh, I know there's other things we could be doing, like cutting the grass, but that's not that exciting tonight. We'll leave it for another week. Um, so it won't be all won't be that long really till we're all back on the grasses, which is where we all want to be. So so I suppose these webinars are coming to an end for the summer. So Chris has given me 15 minutes really to uh to have we chat around this player pathway. Uh so I'm going to get straight into this. Uh the focus on the player pathway um is outlined really in that 2019 report. And as Chris uh noted earlier, it ties in very much to the strategic objectives of the dairy uh, strategies and of the We Are Dairy. Moving on there, Chris, thanks. So what I'm going to try and do is, is do that's it, just hold it there. I so I'm going to have a quick look at the report. I want not get into any depth, but I want to really focus on the player pathway framework because I think that's the most relevant bit for our clubs. Go ahead, Chris. All right. So the first thing is I want to just briefly tell you how we got here, just to give you a bit of a background, why it's important. Look a wee bit at the, the player pathway uh, background, where it's coming from. Uh, what the thinking is around it, I've dropped that philosophy word, but just the thinking around it uh, and then the description of it and then really, you know, what it means to us, uh, the club. So go ahead, Chris. So how did we get here? Well, John Horn came into office, he commissioned a review of uh, the player pathway, if you want, um, and the output was this 2019 report. Uh, and it was chaired by Michael Dempsey. You'll know him as, a, as a, the main coach with the Tipperary hurlers or the so the Kilkenny hurlers down the years. Um, and a very good chairman he was, very thorough. And uh, on top of that, he, he kept to a timeline because a lot of these reports sometimes can go on forever. And it's the, the duration of the, the president's um, stay in office that it takes to get them completed. So 2019 was the timeline and he, and he got it out within that. I suppose the four key areas within the Talent Academy report was this whole area of governance, games, programs, coach education, and this player development framework. And the bit I really wanted to focus on is the player development framework. Uh, to get there, we had 32 county uh, consultations. So each of the counties in, Ul in Ulster, Munster, Leinster, and Connacht had a consultation night, uh, and Derry's was the same at Owen Bay. At that consultation night, there were players, coaches, parents, administrators, fixture makers, representatives from schools, from our clubs, from our academies, uh, from our full time staff. And I think Brian Cuthbert was the guy gathering the information. I think we had over three and a half thousand pieces of information that informed the report. And 220, uh, there was consultation with the LGFA and Camogie just to try and get buy into the one pathway. Uh, and that was successful and they have now put their name to, to the pathway. So that collaboration is very important on the basis of integration. So the focus here is on the framework. Uh, and this slide here on our, our inheritance is our games and all things that go with the GAA. Our sense of community, family, club are embedded in us from an early age. 
and they stay with us throughout. You know, so somebody asks you where you're from, the first thing you say is your, your club. So th that's very important. And people would argue that the GA is losing that a little bit. And um, I suppose this is a chance, as Chris said in the introduction, to refocus on the club uh, and the big blue circle in the middle that we'll see shortly. So the uh, go ahead, Chris. The research for the report, uh, and again, Go again, Chris. Thanks. Yeah. So the uh, as I said, the research was a 32 county research. Uh, it also examined international best practice uh, and research and development that had gone on there. Uh, I, I was involved in conversations with uh, people in Australia, South Africa, uh, across the, the water in England and Scotland, and people down south as well. So there was a lot of uh, discussion and debate around it. The whole idea was to develop uh, a practical framework that can be used and can be easily understood. Uh, it can engage all, engage all of our stakeholders because that's something I think that's maybe missing in our system. We have a lot of people involved uh, and sometimes there's no joined up thinking. And then it'll be used to review, plan and support player development in, in the di di different areas. And finally, it adapted this framework, this FTEM framework, Foundation Talent Elite and Mastery. Uh, and a framework is a framework. It's there really to provide some sort of structure to how we think about what we do and how we do it. And the FTEM framework uh, did that. It's an Australian framework. We've actually spoken to the lady that designed it. To be very honest with you, uh, you look at these frameworks, it's no different from LTAD, from LISPA, those other models or frameworks that were about dramatic development. The only thing visually is it, it shows a wee bit more flexibility on how players can nip in and out of out of our system. So our thinking in this is, in this particular document and, and moving forward is that club is core and we're trying to refocus uh, on the club and on what the club does for our association. We also try to focus on the person and not the player. So we become person centered, all right? The person first, first and the player second. So, you know, it's more important for us and our clubs to know that everybody's well and that everybody is uh, is, is happy in, the, in themselves and in their and their own environments, and then we can start to focus on the on the player and the development of the player. Uh, and that's a big statement. But to be honest with you, you know, we are a community club. We're volunteer driven. We're, we're volunteer based, uh, and we deal with people uh, and families. And we we need to keep the person at the centre of everything that we do. We also want to enhance the coaching experience that players have when they come into our environment. And we also want better connection and more communication between the stakeholders. So if I'm, a, if I'm managing a player in the club, I want to know how he's getting on in school. And if he goes into the development squads, I want to know how he's getting on there. So that this communication is very important. To be inclusive, and the GA for all is very strong in Derry. I know Eisenstein and others are, are very active in that. And that's something that we want to continue. But the big objective is to keep as many people involved in playing our games for, uh, for as long as possible. Thanks, Chris. And again, so here's the pathway uh, visual. At the center, you see the club, the big blue circle, but also the F1, F2 at the bottom is also part of our club environment. Uh, when county teams started becoming successful uh, and winning all Ireland, particularly in Ulster, you know, we found that younger people, uh, younger kids were coming into our clubs and our coaches were saying, what are we going to do with these five, six and seven year olds? You know, so the whole area of fundamental movement skills uh, and the extension of those and the refinement of the movement skills and the sports specific skills at F2 uh, have become ev even more important. And I do remember running a, a, a session in uh, in the recreation centre in Mahara, one like Terence McWilliams and myself, and I think Tony Scullion were over running it. And we had about 140 coaches at that session. It was absolutely amazing. The car park was busting. That's back in 2002, 2003. And it was around this whole area of fundamental movement skills, which was really new on the agenda then, but we know now that a lot of our, our clubs are actually uh, engaged in that. But this particular pathway, you can see how the player can move through the pathway. F1, F2, F3, youth below the line, F3 adult above the line. Those that are potentially talented can go right into the T1, T4 space, which is really our academies. But likewise, someone who jumps from F3 youth up to F3 adult can still make it into a county team. Right, they may be late developers, uh, and it's important that our system is flexible like that. Uh, on the left hand side, top left hand side, you can see the wheelchairs, and again, that's a program that is, has been pushed along and 
is going very well in Ulster, and it's something that we want to uh, expand. Now, I wouldn't be too worried about the uh, the, the the age groups at the minute. Uh, that's maybe it needs to be refined. And it again, Chris, please. So there are three strands underpinning the the framework: the player, uh, the environment, and the game. Uh, <clears throat> the player looks basically at the at the holistic development of the player. Now that might sound a bit airy fairy, but you know we're we're more concerned about the person, as we said at the start, making sure that that person is a well-rounded individual who you know can make a positive contribution back to our clubs and to our communities, and then they'll develop uh, their skills and their techniques after that. The environment as well is very important. Uh, who's in that environment? Uh, how can we as coaches and our clubs help shape that environment? How can we manage that environment? It's very, very important and underpinning this model. And then the game itself, more games, and that's something we're always challenged with. You know, in our own county here, you know, we could have possibly two to three different levels within the under age structures. Uh, and bringing a team, my own team, money more up and getting tanked by one of the big teams really doesn't do anything for the development of the game money more. You know, so we, we need to be looking at that higher games program is set up and that the young people are, are competing at the right level just to keep them involved and playing for as long as possible. The six attributes that we're trying to develop, I suppose, within, um, listen, there could be 16 here, but these are six that were picked out by the group. Uh, six things that we, we saw as we would like to have in our players, and you, you can see them all. They're respectful, committed, responsible. They're the three that I would pick out. The passionate one as well is something that's nurtured, I think, by coaches. You have these young people on the pitch. You, know, you, you develop, you, you show your passion for it, and you develop your passion with the young people that you manage. Uh, so those, those key attributes, attributes are something that we're trying to nurture, if you want, within the model. Go ahead, Chris. So when we talk about the environment, these are the, uh, the, the sort of the dynamics in the environment, the coaches, the parents, teachers, uh, the games program, the GA system, uh, and the peers and the role models that the young people are, are dealing with. You know, so there's a lot going on. And I have another wee piece to the slide, Chris, if you'd hit it, which really looks at the talent phase. Talent phase, uh, I have it here, the T1 to T4, the ecosystem of, uh, of players who move into the T1 to T4 space. And you can see there, we, we could spend a full session on this and this alone you know, with the academy at the minute, at the middle, and all of the other stuff that's ongoing around it. So there's a lot going on there in the environment, and it's our job as coaches to try and manage that environment to the best that we can, given that we're volunteers. Go ahead, Chris. And flick on through that, please. We've covered that. So in terms of the game, I think this is the important piece as well you know that the the key coaching principles that we apply are enjoyment they're challenging it actually looks like a game so kids know exactly well you know what the hell is this you know we, it looks like a game you know there's rules there's goal posts um there's there you have the colored bibs uh, everything set out there's a, a marked off area uh all the players that are there involved and up there they pick the top ones and the other stand watching it's player centered you're really focusing on how that individual is doing and, and the, the key thing in our games is that there's constant decision making because that's what we're trying to create with our senior county teams, better decision makers on the ball. And we need to start that process right from the, from the, on, from the onset. And it was great to see Damien Cassidy on, on, uh, on the social media recently talking about uh, promoting the silent sideline for 2021. Uh, that's really where we want to be. We want to have our young people playing in an environment where they feel safe, they feel challenged, uh, but also they don't feel threatened by uh, coaches who are coming in, into the pitch. And I mean that coming four and five and six metres onto the pitch, shouting instructions. Uh, that's not what we want. That's not where we want to be. So what does it mean for our clubs? Well, the first thing is, and I'm delighted that Gareth is following this, is to have a club-based development programme, you know, where traditionally we would have brought the, the coaches to Ombeg Right. This time around, let's get the coaches out into Craig Ban, Money Moore, Drum, uh, and these and these and these clubs. And you know, let's focus on the people that are in the clubs and make it more of a spoke to them. And Gareth will take you through a process uh, in terms of the club coach planning. You know, a plan that's designed for a club is bespoke to that club and meets the needs of that club. But also the plan moving forward for our clubs is to, I suppose, I'm going to jump down there in terms of content, have a shared curriculum or shared content 
across the schools, the academies and the clubs. So that everybody knows what these young players are working towards when they're in these environments. So we're talking about a partnership deliver, delivery with more focus on the club uh, and helping the club, helping the coaches in the club to get up to speed and to be able to deliver part of the, the common curriculum. Thanks, Chris. So how it looks, we've had that slide, just there's a player pathway there. You can see the progress through, you know, uh, you know, I know one or two of our, of our senior county players who didn't go into any talent phase. They jumped straight from uh, playing senior county into the E1 phase, and that's fine. Those late developers are brilliant. Others have come through the system, minors under 21s and the seniors, uh, and there's a different path for everybody based on their development rate. Go ahead. Second bit is the coaching pathway, and I'll maybe dwell on this just a wee bit, because we have been pushing hard for a more flexible approach to coaching. So it's not just foundation level one, level two, uh, and then into level three. We, we look at a, a coaching award that has core modules around the player, the game and the environment. And then after that, we look at presenting the coaches with options that they can actually buy into. So it's me and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a, a nursery coach, for example, at F1 and F2, you know, that I can really get my teeth into that and get three or four modules in depth, some of which may be able to do online, some of which may require face-to-face, -face. but this whole flexible approach that we're now so used to through these webinars, we need to maximize that to make sure our coaches get an opportunity to uh, engage at the right level. This is maybe thing in thinking, but this notion of that, sorry, just back one, Chris, this notion of a community coach, and the reason I have it in there, and, and this is my slide, it's not a national slide, uh, is that in a lot of our clubs now, we have uh, ex-members coming back. We have people who are there who are members who are not playing members, but who want to engage in physical activity by walking around the pitch, jogging around the pitch, uh, aerobics, whatever. Uh, and I think there's, there's potential there for us to have someone in our, in our I suppose, our, our membership we can take on this role. And also we ran a, a program called Active Clubs uh, as a pilot with Sport NI. Uh, and this is something that we found uh, very, very useful in, in some clubs that took it on. Uh, and that's just something that's there uh, for the time being. It's part, but I think we're, we're going to have a look at that. So the coaching pathway is there, as I say. And uh, at the minute, we're running a program for, uh, for some of our performance coaches that are in that T1 to T4 phase. Uh, and these guys are obviously uh, working in their clubs as well, but we're trying to extend them uh, and their their thought processes around how they manage talented young players. I think my big criticism of all our talent spaces is, and I'm talking across the province here, not just in, uh, not about Derry, but how we manage players into that space and how we manage them out. So somebody gets to 10-4 to T4 and he doesn't make the breakthrough, he goes back into the club. How do we manage that player back into the club? Have we got a strategy in place? Have we got a way to do that to make sure we retain that player and that player becomes one of the best players in the club? Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Finally, I suppose going alongside of this is our, is our referees. Uh, very important that uh, we bring our referees along with us. And sometimes it doesn't sit with coaching and games where I sit, but uh, it's, it's, we have to push it hard. And in particular with our young members, if we can get them into the goal games referees and the young whistlers, then potentially, you know, we could have four or five referees in a club instead of at the moment in some clubs where we're we're struggling to get two referees out. So, you know, the referees pathway has got to be superimposed in this. So as you can see, we have a framework. We put the I put the framework up there and I've tried to align uh, our games program, our coaching program and our referee program on top of that. Uh, and that's the whole idea. And the, the idea of a framework is to identify where there's weaknesses or where there's things uh, that should be happening that are not happening. Uh, and that's, I suppose, uh, my challenge moving forward. Go ahead, Chris. So as I said, this is the LTAD framework. Some of you will have seen this uh, particular graphic. Uh, I know some clubs have actually taken it and blown it up and have it on the wall. Uh, I know some of my own club, many of the was going out and I said, right, I've got the under 16s here. What am I going to do tonight? I know poor planning, but that's the nature of the beast. You know, a lot of the volunteers on the call here will be coming in from home. They'll be grabbing their bag and they'll be heading up to the pitch. Uh, and 
you know, the, the time for planning is, is very limited. Uh, so any sort of visual clue at all that can say to you, right, oh, I could do a bit of that this week because I haven't done that and they were quite weak on that in the last game is very, very important. What's important here is that the different age groups that are reflected in this particular plan actually are parallel to the F1, F2, F3 and the elite phase. The elite phase isn't uh, included in this. Uh, so there, there's, there's content within that that we can still use in terms of developing workshops to fit F1, F2 and F3 as we move forward over the next year. Go ahead, Chris, thanks. <clears throat> so I suppose the takeaways uh, for me really are, you'll put the person first in your club, right? Get to know the individuals, get to know their families and their parents, and you know, put the player second, all right? But the player is obviously very important because you're trying to develop them within your club. And the challenge to, on this, and there's always challenges when we, we, we have a go at these things, is where the hell do I get, a, get time to talk to parents? And I can remember Philip Kerr saying to me one night, he says, I stand at the gate and as the parents come in, I say hello to them, they put their head out the window. And then when they're in, I lock the gate, I tell them, right, now you're here to stay. Come on inside the, come on inside the, the wire here and we'll give you a wee job to do. So, you know, we need to be, we need to be active and we need to be engaging. The second one there is to embed the values uh, and the associated behaviours because our behaviours reflect our values. And, uh, you know, if, if we're saying, you know, we want the following values in our club, you know, then we have to have those associated behaviours. And where people step outside of those behaviours, then that's the challenge for us to try and actually um, manage that. The club coaching audit, uh, develop plan. you're not talking 10 pages here. You know, we can have a good plan on one page Maybe Gareth will give us a template coming up. But the club coaching audit is very important. Find out where you are, where you want to be, and where the gaps are, and then how can we fill those gaps. Um, one of the driving things from our, from our coaching staff in, in counties and in Ulster level is to get into the, into the clubs and support the coaches, uh, this coaching support based on your needs, and then to revisit to help you embed the plan and to deal with any issues that have arisen in the, in the meantime. Coaching... Communities and clubs, that, that sounds very fancy. Well, you know, I've just had a, an approach tonight from a, a, a chairman of a club or an ex-chairman of a club to come to his club to bring his coaches in next week uh, and to, to have a session with them. So that's a community of practice. That's getting coaches together to discuss what's going on uh, and to bring them along the, the coaching journey. Uh, responsibility is another one, you know, and, and I'm saying here to the club coaches, don't wash your hands of this, you know, don't say, oh, that's school, that's the responsibility of the school. Lift the phone to the, to the, to the teacher in the school and say, listen, how's he getting on? How's she getting on? Uh, what are the sort of things we could be working on in the club to help bring them along? Uh, on a similar vein, you know, get up to the development squad uh, session, see what's going on there, see if you can replicate some of that back in your club with the same age group. So there's responsibility on us all. Ultimately, the, uh, the, the player is not the... Is not the it's not owned by anyone, but the player will always return to the club. They started the club and they will return to the club. So you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility for us as club coaches to make sure we look after our, our people, our, 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 our person. And then the last one there is a, a culture of continuous learning. And you know, I'm, I'm on the wrong side of 60 now, unfortunately, but uh, I always say that every day is a learning day, a classroom day, and you never stop learning. And, uh, and and I think that's important, you know, so just in summary, the framework's there. We're going to be trying to map in workshops, webinars on top of the framework to fit the needs of what's required at that particular stage in the framework. Uh, and it's no more than that. It's, it's no less than that. So it's not complicated. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Eugene. Eugene. Um, I'm just going to stop this wee bit. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen there. Uh, I suppose um, a lot of rich stuff there, and I want to try and keep this webinar as interactive and as personable as we can um, for coaches and, as you mentioned, for volunteers that are on the ground. I know what it's like coaching nursery. I've done that the last two years, and you literally are coming in, lifting the bag of balls, lifting the bag of cones, and out, and next thing you know, you're faced with 30 or 40 screaming children, so it's not easy. Um, 
I suppose when we were sitting down going through our 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 coaching strategy for the for the county, the F ten model that you just went through was very much at the forefront of our mind. And particularly looking at F one and F two, the nursery space and the go game space, um, and how important that was. And I suppose we have launched our Go Games in association with JKC. I'll give them a shout out um, as the new sponsors. But I think everybody in the group, the key thing that they felt um, was just getting back to your roots in terms of providing everybody with a game at Go Games level, trying to remove the the excess competition that might have been creeping in at the older age groups, um, giving ch giving children an opportunity to develop at their own rate. Um, and just making it a, a more funner, better experience. And I suppose um, the launch of the Go Games, whenever we get going with that, I know we had planned after Easter, we have pushed that back to the beginning of May. Hopefully that's realistic, um, but hopefully we'll see a bit of a change in terms of the Go Games and around some of the themes and the strategies that are going to be implemented. Side and Sidelines is one of them. Eugene's right, they may launched that a few weeks ago. They may actually talk a wee bit of flack from the group about sound sidelines because he likes to shout, but he informs <laughs> us that he has, he has never shouted at an under eight. Um, so that's a really important one for coaches that are on the call is just trying to get that embedded in our clubs, giving children the opportunity to play the games and let them communicate on the pitch as opposed to us trying to tell them what to do. We talk a lot, and all of us are the same, about trying to empower players and trying to create better communicators, yet we're constantly shouting on the pitch and encroaching on the pitch to try and get them to do what we're looking to do. So the two go hand in hand. The other one is, is around the nursery, and I know we have ran a few nursery webinars within the county recently. My plan is to pull them together, and the next few webinars around the nursery programme will, will be a bit more hands-on as to what do you actually do. What do you do when you're faced with 30 or 40 wee ones and them screaming in the hall full of excitement? Um, and that'll be brought together as a resource. Just before we move on to Gareth, and um, if there's anybody any questions they want to pose to Eugene at this juncture instead of jumping on, because I know there was a lot of stuff within that, um, and I'm sure people have maybe questions they want to, to address. So if anybody's any questions, we'll take a couple now and we can revert to that at the end, but I'm just conscious about jumping on to Gareth before giving people an opportunity to comment in Eugene's bit. Eugene, there's one from Martin Robinson. In terms of the coach training, when's it going to be started to roll out? Coach training, um, well, at the minute, Chris, obviously your staff are all furloughed by yourself. Um, but Gareth, who's coming on now, will, will address that. Uh, Martin, you know, so we're available now at any stage to, to start. We're already involved with clubs. I think there's around about 80 clubs across the province that are already taking up this offer. So uh, that coach training is available probably fairly, fairly, fairly quickly. All right, thank you, James. Good man. Um, James, do you want to actually come on and just ask a question instead of me trying to read it here in small text? I'll unmute you here in just two seconds, James. If I can find you. Ah, uh, sorry, James. I can't unmute you. I, the way it is set up. I can take it anyway. Uh, this is just around James. This is around Gar uh, Gareth's session. You know, so he'll take you through a template basically that you can use to do the review. Um, so it's very straightforward. Uh, and then what the plan would be moving out of that. So I think uh, this question is really around Gareth's area, Chris. Which is coming up. Okay, good. Yeah. And yeah. James, you're right. Um, one of the key priorities in terms of the club uh, coaching priority in the We Are Dairy section was that every club would carry out their own audit and that they would produce a strat or a, a bit of a plan. Eugene touched on it there earlier on. It doesn't need to be a document, one page, uh, clearly bought in by, by the various stakeholders, players, coaches, um, club officials, and people sort of have an idea of where they're going. Neil is actually going to touch on this later on as well, how Steel Sound have implemented the coaching strategy who was involved as well. 
Um, so hopefully that will come up. James, how do you get information about coach training? Again, again, from our Ulster perspective, Chris, we were we are not providing any training until the, the club engages and has a go at the audit and the plan. You know, and, and on the basis of that, then the coaches would be assigned out to, to to the clubs, you know, based on their needs. So it might be something said something around nurseries, then it would be a particular coach that would go out and do that. If it was something around working with the senior team, then it might be a different coach. You know? So uh, it depends on the needs. But you need to do the the plan first with with uh, what with Gar's going to talk about, and um, then it goes from there. Okay, we'll move on to Gareth. Um, I have your slides here, Gareth. So we'll just start a few. Are you? You want to give me control there, Chris? Uh, well, I think I have it on that, Gareth. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a nightmare here in terms oh, of. Oh, you're all right. You know what? I can flick on. It might be easier, Gareth, if you don't I mind. No worries. You work away. Yep. If you want to flick on uh, the first slide there, Chris. All right. So look, um, for the people who are on the call, Gareth uh, works for Ulster GA, leads the club coaching support program. Um, he's going to run us through a few slides here around um, having a, a coaching review, what to do, how to set it up, who to include. Um, he also has put together a lot of resources on the Ulster Council website. Um, that again, we'll share the link to this within this chat later on. Um, so there's a whole lot of information that he's already provided coaches on that platform. So um, again, anybody, any questions for Gareth, we'll touch on them at the end. All right, Gareth. Okay, thanks, Chris. Okay, this evening, so we're going to look at the, the our club coaching structures, planning a coaching review, and um, how we go about doing it, who needs to be involved, and, and factors involved in that, and then how to conduct and develop a coaching strategy for your club. So again, you know, the, the things you need to try and get in place to develop a strategy, who needs to be involved and what that really looks like. And then there's a wee bit just around coach buy-in. So if you're a coaching officer in the club or a, a committee member and you're maybe struggling to get buy-in from your coaches, a couple of ideas and we'll maybe try and open up the mics or open up the chat box, get a wee bit of discussion going around that as well. Go on ahead there, Chris. So... Developing a club coaching philosophy, and so the, the first thing is how do we do it? So, firstly, you need a coaching officer, and secondly, you need a coaching committee. So, in the chat box, I think we've been around 34, 35 people on the call, and um, some of you may be from the same club, which is grand. But in the chat box, if you have a coaching officer in place, and if you have a functioning coaching committee in place, can you just put a thumb up into the chat box? And we just seen behind many out of the out of the people on the call have uh, have have something in place. There will be a bit of a time lag here, so I'll just continue to talk and I can keep an eye on the chat bar coming through. So we've a couple through there, which is good. So in terms of a of a coaching officer, we're looking here, so there's a coaching officer and a coaching committee, um, and and the roles of, of each of them. So the coaching officer, the role is to chair the coaching committee. You know, that person in the club probably needs to be someone, you know, who is A, well respected and B, has a good knowledge of, you know, so coaching in games, has a good knowledge of the dynamic in the club and has a good knowledge of the coaches and the people at their disposal. At disposal. And they need to oversee the development of a coaching plan or a coaching philosophy. So, you know, your coaching plan sort of dovetails into your philosophy. They have to promote coach education. So within the club as a coaching officer, do you know when, for example, these types of webinars are on this evening from, from Chris and Dairy GA? Are you keeping tabs with what's going on at provincial level and national level and sharing things with, with your coaches? And there's been endless opportunities over the past year. And like that pre-COVID and, and hopefully post-COVID, we're back in the grass. You know, do you have that network available there that you know when there's workshops on that you can sign post your coaches to? You have to try and monitor and review the coaching standards within the club. So, so what this means from a coaching officer's perspective is that if there's a plan in place that you're you're communicating with the coaches in the club, the lead coaches are, are the coaching committee, and you're constantly reviewing as to what's going on on the grass. You know, so you know, traditionally in clubs, what happens? We generally meet maybe October, November. People are forced in, or they're asked, you know, do you want to take that team again? Yep, I'll take them, and then you're sent off on your own devices, and you know, you 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 meet again October, November, and 
you're all the same grievances and the same people say the same things and nothing actually gets done. Um, now, what's going on in the pitch is probably grand, but you know, in terms of if you're monitoring and reviewing it, could it be better? You know, and it was mentioned in the last Eugene's bit about setting standards and stuff, you know, so as a coach and officer, you can set them standards from day one. You're there to liaise with the county GDM, so you're there to liaise with Chris and, and so pull from Chris as much as he can. He mightn't, he mightn't like me saying that, but in terms of the GPOs and the staff and development club school links and stuff, you know, there's a support network there that if you can if you can buy into what the county's trying to do, I'm sure you'll get a wee bit of support. Um, and then probably the main role of a coaching officer is to delegate. You know, it, it is a very important role in the club now. And in the past three or four years, we would run specific coaching officer training through a new officer workshop. Um, you know, so it's probably seen now as as an important role as your club chairman, club secretary, etc., that they're actually holding specific workshops to upskill our club coaching officers. Then I suppose that feeds into your coaching committee. And um, so, and again, your coaching committee is a committee there that's separate from your from from your executive committee or, or the other or other committees in your club. It's solely about coaching in games. You know, when you meet, there's no talking about you know governance or finance or any of these sorts of things. It's just about coaching in games and, and what needs to be done in the club. The ideal scenario is you've one person from each age group from under sevens right through to under seventeens. Does that one person need to be the lead coach or the manager? No, they don't. It needs to be someone who's going to get things done. So you want to surround yourself with people in this committee that's going to that's going to make things happen or, or get things done. Um, you're to meet well, try to meet monthly from October to February. So through the winter, you know you're probably trying to have your winter program going and your club school link up and going, and then a, a monthly meeting from October through to February. And again, it's to look at your review for the year. It's to look at your plan for next year. Your, your coach recruitment and you know all them types of things, your coach education and getting all them them things lined up that when you hit the grass in March, you're only really worrying about what's actually taking place on the grass. And the reality of it then, whenever we have, you know, we start back out and the season kicks off and competition gets in from March onwards in an ordinary year, you know, the reality of it is you're not going to get to meet every month. So, you know, if you're aiming to meet three times per year between March and September, it should be sufficient. You're hoping that you'll have a good line of communication already established that you, you will be meeting each other at the feet and stuff anyway. Um, role of the coaching committees then is to assist in devising the plan and philosophy and then trying to roll that out to assist in the appointment and the recruitment of coaches and managers. And it's probably a big thing in, in all our clubs that you know, we do struggle to recruit volunteers. And then you're there to try and help develop and promote your club school link. So I think maybe we had one, two, three... Maybe eight or nine thumbs up in the in the chat box. Could you still put a thumb up after seeing that slide or hearing that summary of the coaching officer and the coaching committee? You know, so what what I probably outlined there is an effective coaching officer and an effective coaching committee. Um, you know, so I may, if if you feel I've missed something there that maybe your coaching committee is doing, feel free to add it into to the chat box and, and we we pick up on it. But that probably is the, the, the role and the remit of a coaching officer and a coaching committee. Um, so to have them, you know, to, to have all these ducks in a row before even looking at a plan or a philosophy or, or, or looking at any type of structure, my advice would be to try and get, to try and have a, an effective coaching officer and then a functioning coaching committee and try and start to get all these boxes ticked. Just move on to the next slide there, yep. So... Developing your club coaching philosophy, how do we go about doing it? You know, so you don't create a philosophy of signs and slogans, you create a philosophy of people and leadership. So the signs and slogans are great and you know they, they might look good on the wall and they may be good as a PR or a marketing tool, but if you don't have the right people in place showing the right leadership, you're probably going to go nowhere and the signs and slogans will only just be signs and slogans. So how do we go about developing this philosophy? We meet, talk, 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 and keep talking. You know, so it's not going to happen in one meeting. It may not happen in year one. It could be year two, year three, year four before you really get things going from a coaching and games perspective in your club the way you want to. So the only way to keep doing that is to persevere with it. You meet up, talk about it, go and get one thing done, talk about it again, get another thing done, and that wheel doesn't stop. That just keeps going continually from year on year. You know, so you'll see the plan do review model there. So you plan something, you do it, you review it, and then you go back to the start again. Plan the next thing, get it done, review it. And this doesn't need to be done formally. These aren't, you know, things you have to sit down, you know, once a week or once a month with the coaching committee and say, right, let's plan this out. 
let's get it done and review it. It could be a case of saying, right, we need to get a foundation award course organised, right, who's going to do it? I look after that, right, I have to contact Chris, I go and contact Chris, get it done, went to sort it out, right, did we get everybody in place? We did, everyone qualified, yes, everyone, you know, have their safeguarding as well, we do, perfect, right, what's the next thing we need to do? And they're the type of things from a coaching and games perspective that you need to, you need to probably start looking at and, and just sort of go and get in, going and doing them. But, but there's no fancy or, or, or so scientific way to do these things. It's, you know, you meet up, you have a chat, talk things around, you know the dynamic of your club, what needs to be done, right? Let's pick one or two things, get them done, and then we move on to the next thing. Do you want to go on to the next slide there, Chris? And then I suppose the, the, the club's coaching philosophy and, and what is it, why do we need it, and how do we develop it? So it's a club coaching philosophy is created from within. It will be created by the club, the coaches, and the players, and it must be realistic, achievable, and sustainable. So it has to be created from from use from from the people in the club that it means something to every club coaching philosophy will be different because every club will have their own their own issues or they're unique in its own sense the club the coaches and the players all have to have a say in it you know that's what it's all about if we don't have you know if the club doesn't have coaches there's nobody to coach the players or vice versa if the club aren't recruiting enough players with coaches there they've no one to coach so all three have to sort of buy into this and, and, and then make it achievable. So we talk about values, and again, it was touched on in Eugene's presentation. We need to keep people in the club involved. You know, so again, you know your own club. You know who the who the drivers are there. It's trying to get them people on board, let them have their say. Um, again, back to our coaching committee, you know, some of them key coaching, some of them key people could or, or, or may not be on the coaching committee, but it, it's having the key co the coaching committee and the key people involved together developing a set of values that you, you want to see the club adhere to and then going about getting it sorted and it has to be club and coach driven so this won't work if the club are driving an agenda and the coaches are driving a different agenda you know there's going to be a collision somewhere along the route there so it's just back to getting everyone around the table getting the right people in place and, and talking it out coming up with a set of values that are unique to your club or that you see fitting for your club and then working them in towards working them down as well through the rest of your coaches and then through the players. Through your behaviours then, so it leads from your values into your behaviours, they have to be agreed. So again, you know, there has to be some sort of an agreement on a way forward, on a plan, on a philosophy from from the coaches in the club. Now not everyone's going to agree to it. So along the road there has to be, you know, you have to be open to change. You have to be open to constructive feedback and and you know and I suppose in all our clubs, we do have the dominant people who want it done their way and sometimes throw, throw the toys out of the pram. But, you know, as a coaching officer, a coaching committee, it's probably a case of well, how do we pull everyone together? How do we take everyone's opinions on board and then look at an agreed an agreed philosophy or agreed plan that is, is going to help the needs of the club? In terms of our behaviours and, and discipline falls into that, in terms of our discipline on the field and our discipline off the field. So, probably looking at your philosophy from a coach's point of view and your discipline as a coach in terms of your application towards training, you know, how disciplined you are and what, what that message you want to get across to your players is. Alternative then is how do we want our players, what discipline sort of, what, what do we want them to stand for and, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and then our commitment. So, you know, my advice to any club coaching officers on the call would be is that it's a minimum of three year term in your club if you can stick it out for that long. Year one, you're probably not going to make a whole pile of headway. You're probably going to meet more resistance and, and you're going to bang your head of a brick wall more times than enough. But I see Eugene has small steps in the chat box. If you pick one or two things and you get them done, you, you'll slowly but surely start, coaches start to say, well, this, this man or this woman, they're getting things done. You know, it's not the usual age old. We have this meeting once a year. We say we're going to do this and then we actually do nothing about it. So it's having that commitment to buy in for, you know, at least three years. And, and you will see, you know, you will see a difference in, in year two and year three and, and you'll have more and more people coming with you. Probably that feeds us into our time and best part there. So as a coaching officer, again, you know, it's, it's, Back to the, the second slide there, but trying to tick all them boxes as a coaching officer. But the main thing is, is getting the right people around you, you know, and, and developing that community of practice from, from with the coaches in the club that you can keep developing, developing the whole thing. And probably the most important thing, it hasn't been touched upon here, the coaching philosophy is centered around the player. You know, so it's not about what the coaching officer wants or the club wants or certain coaches. It has to be player centered. So 
when we look at how do we develop our players firstly as as footballers and then secondly as people that they're going to stay within the club and they could pick up a different role in the club in years to come but how do we keep developing our our players and how does that feed into our philosophy and then last thing's the culture and probably one of these buzz buzzwords we hear in clubs and you know that club has a great culture and they have a great identity and, and those sorts of things but those stronger clubs maybe that have that or the perceived culture that had to start from somewhere you know where did it start from did they sit around the table and have a discussion on this and talk about what they stand for and who we are and did they set a set of standards they may have or they may not or maybe they're just a strong club and had success and and so maybe success maybe breeds that culture and identity and, and maybe success sets those standards but there's nothing to stop any club setting standards in terms of commitment, discipline, timekeeping, organization, you start with the small, simple things and you get them right, you won't be too long till that becomes ingrained in your players, that becomes ingrained in your coaches. Hopefully, they'll stay playing, hopefully they'll stay committed, they'll keep developing and then somewhere along the line, success will happen. And that, and for, for clubs, success is different. You know, for certain clubs, feeding the team at every age group success, which other clubs are going to be looking to win things when, when they start getting on through the pathway. So that's, you know, back to that, who, who we are as a club, what do you stand for? What is your culture? What are your values? Does Do the coaches know what they are? Do the players know what they are? Do you have any? If you don't, how can you start, you know, how can you start you know, setting a culture and, and, and setting values? Um, how would you as a club like to be perceived from the outside, you know, so... What do you want clubs from the outside saying about you? You know, do you want to say, oh, they're a shower, such and such, or no, they're real accommodating and you know, good, honest, good, honest group and this sort of stuff, you know? So, you know, something to keep in the back of your mind that as a club, what, what do you want to be received as when you, when you leave? Um, and then, probably that culture, the, the important thing is, is the development v winning, you know? So, what in your coaching philosophy, you know, is it is a developmental approach? Is it a winning approach? You know, winning's going to come into it at some stage. You know, being realistic, we'd love to have it at all developmental, but that's that's not the case. So, at what stage do we do we switch from the development into the winning? And and or there's a, there's a wee bullet point underneath that. Can we have development at all costs? So we do see, you know, we hear all this winning at all costs and this sort of stuff as as clubs and coaches. Do we talk about development at all costs? So at all costs, how can we develop our players? And as coaches, what do we need to do to try and develop our players? That's you now, Chris. And then lastly, so it's long-term development, the coach bay. And so as and as clubs, it's probably a conversation we have every year. You know, we need a couple of helpers. How are we going to get the parents in? How are we going to get the coaches to stay in and, and, and buy in and that sort of stuff? So the bottom one there is ownership. Let coaches have their say. So again, it's when you're developing this philosophy or plan, you're trying to get all the coaches in the room at the same time or the minute you can get them on a, on a Teams or Zoom call at the same time and still have an effective conversation. Let them have their say. Take all the, take what, 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 what their opinions and what they're saying on board because they're the people on the grass. They're the people that's, that's at, the, at the front face two, three times a week. Um, reward them and make them feel valued. You know, So is it something as... you know? I heard a couple of years ago in the club they bought them all whistles and stopwatches, uh, and the coaching officer told me it was a two, it, it a two prong um, approach to this that he turned up a couple of times and there was coaches who didn't have a whistle, so he knew that at least this this season coming in that every coach was going to have a whistle and a stopwatch, but it was also something nearly to say thank you, you know, and something a gesture so small. It, it could mean an awful lot and, and I'm sure you have your own ideas around maybe coaches get a wee bit of gear or, or they get a, a, a night out at the end of the year or whatever it is, but. It's back to something so small. The coaching officer, or somebody from the coaching, the coaching committee, or the club executive committee, they see somebody in the car park at the end and they say thanks. They ask him how he's getting on. You're under eights. You know, it's 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 just trying to engage with them, and that will mean a lot. And um, it's investing time into them, so and that sort of leads into your development opportunities. So provide opportunities for them. If there's a foundation award course or, or an award one course, could the club fund it or part fund it? If there's you know prevents their national conferences coming up and there's a couple of coaches going to it. Could, could, the, could the club fund these type of things? And again, I think in the grand scale of things, it's probably not going to cost the whole pile, but you're investing your time in them, you're showing them your care, and then you're also giving them giving them that time to develop. And then I suppose trying to help your coach with the long-term development as a coach is probably a wee bit off topic here in terms of, but it, from a coaching philosophy and something that's probably going to be more more um, important now in the next couple of weeks when we get back together is your coaching teams. You know, is your coaching teams getting together and setting goals and targets for 
for the coming season, whatever age group you're with. And that could be in terms of your communication with each other, your communication with the parents, communication with the players, your plan in the next couple of months. And Eugene touched on it. As coaches, do we plan? You know, I would disagree slightly with Eugene. And sometimes it's hard to get, get time to plan. It is, yes, but you don't need to plan your session in the day if you're training. You know, you can, you know you're can. training Tuesday night. There's nothing wrong with sitting down on a Saturday evening or Sunday morning for five or ten minutes and... Putting, putting a bit of a plan together and sharing the coaches' WhatsApp group that everyone knows what, what's happening. And then having that review, you know, again, and this can be done via your WhatsApp groups or whatever whatever format you use. But as coaches, do you sit down? Do you have a chat with each other at the end of each month? You know, and say, right, how did training go that month? What went well? What didn't go well? You know, how can we fix it? What's coming up next month? Are there any certain aspects you need to work on or any players you need to look at and, and, and all these sorts of things? And that probably feeds in into the last bit is self-reflection as a coach. So as a coach, do you do any self-reflection? Do you go away from your session and, and look at yourself and say, right, well, how did that go for me this evening? What could I have done better? Do you seek any feedback from any of your 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 the coaches in, in your own group and say, listen, how do we listen to me, Nate? And I want you to listen how I get this message across. Am I talking too much, you know, or how's my language or what, what language am I using? What's my body language like? And probably a powerful way is get someone to video you. Have them stand behind you. Probably quite cringeworthy, mind you, but have them uh, have them video video you from behind, and then listen to yourself back, and uh, you'll pick up an awful lot in terms of the message you're delivering. And, and Chris had said it. We probably, as coaches, we always talk about giving the players ownership, but as coaches, we still like to take centre stage and talk too much. So probably a, a, a good tool to um, to see if you are talking too much. So on that, Chris, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Excellent, Gary. Seconds here, I'll take us off. Gareth, thanks very much for that. Uh, again, a lot of good information there. Um, this presentation will be made available um, on the DAO website so people can get an opportunity to go back through it again. I suppose one of the things for me there was just something that stuck out was you know, just talk, 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 and talk in terms of talking to your coaches, um, trying to create opportunities to have a chat. And it, it doesn't need to be formal all the time. It could be over a beer. Um, it could be out for a walk. You know, but just getting that opportunity to talk. And I do think we have all used um, technology better during lockdown than what we maybe were using it. And I think uh, the likes of Teams and Zoom and these platforms are a good opportunity maybe to get uh, conversations as well um, if people are finding it difficult for time. But it should be a bit of crack within our clubs. I don't want people going away here thinking that oh, this is very serious stuff. Um, it could literally be three points this year that we're going to do. One, set up a foundation course. Two, provide our coaches with enough equipment to deliver what we're looking to do, whether that be footballs, whether it be cones, um, whatever it is they feel they need. The third one might be that we, 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 have a, we have a meeting or we have a chat once every month. And I know uh, at Club and Dairy that had a coaching committee that met over a card game every month. Um, and I think some of the best decisions came from that. So it's just about creating opportunities to chat um, and just don't be put off with, uh, with it needing to be too structured. That's where we know we don't want to be sending that message out, but a lot of good information there, Gareth. Thanks a million for that. In terms of um, our next part, and again, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to let Neil Forrester introduce himself for people that don't know him. And then we're just going to have a bit of a chat with Neil around uh, some of the work that he's done with Steelstown. Um, how to, who's been involved, how's it been going, um, so that type of thing. So, Neil, can you come in there and we'll get a wee chat? Hi, can you hear me all right there? Good enough, first class, yep. Yeah. Uh, happy days. Um, cheers, all right, Chris. do you want to introduce yourself and your role then? Uh, so I'm a games promotion officer, folks. I work with Derry GA, but specifically with Stacetown Brian Oaks. So my job is mostly recruiting and retaining players, going to primary schools, coaching players, and providing support then for Stacetown Gaelic Club. Uh, so between last year and now this year, I'm the coaching officer as well. So it sort of moved on to that role a wee bit. So I'm trying to get less time coaching on the pitch and more support for coaches which is part of the plan, I think, for Chris's and uh, the boys' DIGA 
plan for the next few years as well. So providing more coaching support. So we've actually done two coaching plans at this point. Um, one at the end of 2016, it was led by Ulster GA. I think it was Lizzie came in at the time for us. We had discussions over four weeks. I think we had sessions down at the clubhouse. We got key people in the club, maybe eight or nine fellas, a couple of key ladies coaches in, and just had a discussion on how to build a plan from there. And we started a new one then last year. So that was three years old. And as a coaching officer, I'd done the structure that Gareth had gave us uh, through one of his workshops. So we'd done a new plan in 2020. It was a wee bit different because of COVID. We actually used surveys and SurveyMonkey. So there was two different approaches that we used um, to get more or less the same result. So yes, 2016, we had workshops. All the key people were there. So who was involved? All our key coaches, our most experienced coaches, our level twos. So we're blessed we had Paddy Campbell, who's worked with Derry Miners, Brenton Hughes, level two coach, James McGurk, level two coach. We try to get those key people involved, as well as senior management at the time, which would have been Paul O'Hay and even Gibson, so they can have a say on how they wanted the club to go in terms of coaching and playing. Um, and then obviously your coaching officers, and then input from coaches from around the club. So you might have had, we had maybe one of our under 12 coaches, uh, has a keen interest, um, some of our key ladies coaches as well. I'm trying to build a plan from that platform, getting the right people in, as Gareth had mentioned earlier. Uh, we done a SWOT analysis. So whenever we were sitting down with our our meeting, which was probably the only downside to meeting up in a, in a committee room and having our chat is they can go on and on and on. And that was the case for us in 2016. So there is positives, the surveys, and there's Negatives, in the same way there's positive and negatives sitting in a room. We got out very late a few nights, let's just say that. So in 2016, we did that, sat down, had our long discussions and came up with probably in the end up 10, 12 targets that we wanted to try and achieve. And that was done. We achieved that. We're doing our SWOT analysis. So we looked at strengths of the club. So what were we good at? Our weaknesses, right? What were, what were we falling down on? Our opportunities, so being in the city, which this town is. What did we have access to that maybe others didn't? And then threats, what were the challenges we faced that others didn't? Because obviously a club like Claudia and Screen or Swatter are all going to have very different problems that we're going to have. And the same way they're going to have advantages and we're going to have advantages that maybe they don't have. Um, so doing a SWOT analysis was really important. So sit down with those people, go through, right, what are we good at? What are we not so good at? What can we do or what do we have that's a big advantage to us? Um, and what's the extra challenges and build your coaching plan from those platforms and those four questions will cover all the bases so it could cover your facilities it could co cover actual coaching coaching education uh club school links it's it can be really a huge project if you wanted it to be but as gara said and chris says try and take those small steps and aim for if you're doing like three or four key targets over the course of the year would nearly be enough the other big thing um you'll gain a lot of information is doing your player audit uh, i'm sure gareth and chris eugene they'll have the wee slides and the worksheets that you can actually work through so we done a player audit from under eights the whole way through to senior to see how many players we had at every age group boys and girls the amount of information you gain from that is unbelievable in terms of your coaching and your game strategy from there so for us uh because I'm the games promotion officer, I'm in primary schools, we've got a really strong school club link. So in terms of player recruitment and retention, we were actually healthy in that side of things. What we probably struggled with was making sure we get game time for everybody. So we can build, we built our plan by finding out that information. At the same time, we still had gaps. So some of our girls teams maybe were coping with only 12 players. That was great information for me then. I could go into the schools, targeted those age groups and try to recruit more players for those uh, teams to keep the uh, keep the club going nice and strong at underage level. So and as I mentioned, just, how did you in terms of your player audit? How did you go about that? And was that a surprise to the other coaches in terms of your numbers? Um, it's very easy. Well, for me, then coaching officer, especially with this the one last year. Everybody in our club has to do take attendance, attendance of uh, all the players. Like I'm sure most clubs do the same. Um, 
and it was just a case of getting those numbers back so getting all the dates of births and making sure well basically if we have 2005 group or something or we have only seven that are born in 2005 but we've 22 born in 2006 and we know then that there's going to be possibly a gap in one of the age groups and targeting that in the schools program yeah you targeted the schools program to suit the gaps yeah that's what we would have done there yeah um, good. so i already mentioned about the key people involved uh so that was our senior management minor management most experienced coaches but what i found and we found as a club especially with the surveys is a great chance for your more quiet coaches uh your less experienced coaches they have some fantastic ideas and we find that because those big meetings you've got your big personalities and we all know it um and sometimes it's a big shouting match to who can get their information over the loudest this is what i found with the surveys last year particularly and again it was the same thing we set out seven or eight questions uh what are we doing what do you think we're doing well as a club what can we improve on what would you like to see more of and then a few rating questions like how do you rate facilities how do you rate our ability to get players games things like that what i found then we sent that survey out to under eight coaches tens twelves takes a wee bit longer in terms of getting all that feedback together but some of the points especially less experienced coaches have um or new coaches some of the information they have is invaluable because they see it from a different perspective than we do, that we're stuck in the clubs for six, seven, 10, 20, 30 years. Maybe we can't see because of the blinkers. So surveys, the less experienced coaches can bring the fantastic information for your club development plan. Um, in terms of how you're- 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it seems that you gather up a lot of information. Oh yeah, unbelievable feedback in a short in a short space of time. So from you know, from you started this till you know, getting the group together, having the long evenings and stage and having a chat. How long did it take to get a plan pulled together? And whose responsibility was it to sort of pull the plan together? Or what way did you go about doing that? Um, at time, those were led by Ulster at that time, but. It was nearly in conjunction, so we had Lizzie from Ulster, but it was in conjunction with the coaching officer, who was James McGurk at the time. His responsibility was putting that plan together on paper and giving people roles and responsibilities to deliver. So if we had a target, such as, um, what do we have down there? I think one of ours at the time was making sure all our coaches were vetted and child protection covered. Uh, so James assigned that then to the child protection officer and maybe himself to make sure that that target was met within a time frame. Um, so we had the, or whatever it was, 12 points in James made sure they review that on maybe every three, four months, if we possibly did. Now we didn't have to all our targets, it's obviously pretty difficult and we're also focused on coaching, that is tricky, but trying to review it every few months and go, right, what's the next target we want to achieve? Can we meet it? Um, and as Gareth said, sometimes it takes two years, sometimes it takes three years. When we started our 2020 plan, there were still two or three that we talked about in 2016 we didn't achieve. But if we achieve six or seven other ones, then we're further forward as a club, which is fantastic. Did the process improve in terms of how it was pulled together in 2020 as opposed to 2016? Yeah. Did you learn any lessons about how to get it pulled together? Yeah, it was a lot more streamlined and we made sure the right people were getting the tasks. So for upskilling coaches and stuff, making sure that the coaching officer was assigned that role and sending out that information. Um, we had maybe one strategy we wanted to bring more game analysis to, in 2016, we talked about game analysis and trying video games, but we never assigned that job really to anybody to go, right, that's your job to solve that problem, and get that implemented at the club. Because we didn't assign anybody, it's it's still on the agenda now for 2020 you know, that's three years later and we still haven't achieved that so what we've learned then is make sure it's planned with maybe a deadline get the right person in in place to do that job um and review it constantly to make sure you know things aren't slipping through the cracks and you're missing some of your key targets that can have a huge benefit to the club so i think we're a bit more streamlined um, and focused and small achievable goals as opposed to trying to revolutionize everything from 2016. Neil, in your role as GPO and now coaching officer, um, if you know, you're know you giving advice to clubs, what would be the 
what would be the five main things that you know from 2016 to 2020 and now in 2021 um, that you feel that the club, from a coaching perspective, looked at and, and was successful with? It's it's going to be the same for most clubs. Um, your club school link probably sits at the very top because if you don't get players, you're not going to function as a club for very long. Making good, strong school club links. For us, maybe that wasn't the key target because it was left to me to get on with the, the job that I was doing, which is fine. Um, other clubs maybe don't have that club school link, so that's the key one. Second is coach education and upskilling your coaches, something that we targeted as well. Um, obviously, there's less GA heads floating around the city, so we've got a lot of new coaches, um, maybe different sporting backgrounds, but trying to get them upskilled and educated. We've, we've quite a few level two coaches, and that's a huge benefit to us, even if they're not from maybe traditional GA backgrounds or anything like that. So coach education, because better coaches means better players. Um, and that's exact, That's what we want, because the player-centered approaches, as Eugene and stuff was saying. Uh, games development and skill development kind of tie in together. Giving players game opportunities was huge for us. We used our geography, maybe traveling to South Derry, it was a bit more of a challenge for us on a Saturday. So we started to use an Ashone and cross the border just to use local teams like Bert and Bonkrana, who were right on our doorstep and provided more games for our players. Like I say, we, we were trying to get B teams and stuff and making sure everybody was getting playing opportunities. Uh, so those were probably the key ones, coaching, coach education, club school links and uh, game development, skill development as well. So the only other one we were looking is in house uh, coaching development as well. So holding our own coaching days because we've got a new coaches and experienced trying to pass on the information then we have uh, to the new recruits. Good. Anything else, Chris? Then actually, um, the way in, other thing. In, I, I, in, terms, I, in terms of your plan in 2020, Neil, where's that at now? Or what's happening with it? What have you been up to? Uh, we. Started that that plan was put together. At the, I think it was around March. It was just at the very start of COVID. We were able to get the surveys out, and that's the only reason we thought of surveys is because of the COVID situation. It's amazing the sort of things that come out of it. Um, we've actually achieved quite a few wee bits off that already, even though it was a short season and we haven't really been together. A couple of facility uh, like floodlights, training floodlights, wee bits, we had wee bits on facilities like that that was able to be achieved fairly quickly. Again, small targets, achievable targets, and people get a real buzz when they see progress and being positive as well. Um, so we're getting we're getting there, but again, it's a two, three year process, like as Gareth said. As long as we keep chipping away and people see progress, then it's always a good thing. Good, good man, Neil. Um, that was a good insight. Enjoyed that. Hopefully some of the people on the call got a bit of an idea as to how you went about it and who was involved in the timeline, whatever. Does anybody have any questions they want to fire into the chat for either Neil, Gareth, Eugene or myself? Um, probably take about five minutes here of questions if people have anything they want to post in. Any other comments from your end, Gareth or, or Eugene? No, pro pro I, probably just a touch on, on Neil there. Um, Chris, was the process they went through is pulling everyone together and, and was the, the, the SWOT analysis and going through the, the good, bad and the ugly of the club, you know, and, and pulling everything out and getting a good, open, honest discussion. It's the only way, it's the only way forward, you know. Um, I have a draft sample, Chris, of uh, a completed plan that I can share with you and you can send out with your resources in. Um, and it just gives those of people on the call an indication as to the type of things that will come up. And as, as Neil alluded to, you know, having your player numbers audit, it's huge. Um, it gives you a good indication where you're going and if you need to be more recruitment or if you, know, if you need more coaches, need to recruit more coaches if you have a, have a big group of players and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff, you know. So um, I can share that with you and you can send it out. Thanks, Gareth. My plan is to put together a, a bit of a page with this video um, and the resources that clubs can start themselves in terms of this process of planning. Um, and then we'll come in and support them to um, maybe pull the plan, plan together, help them maybe with the review. But I th like being through this with various clubs, um, it was maybe with three clubs last year going through this within the county, 
I think it's fair to say that clubs can start this process on their own. Would that be, would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah. They can start on their own. Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. It's just, um, it's, it's nice to have a third party in, you know, to try and, um, as Neil was saying, control the audience. <laughs> Yeah. Make sure everybody has an input. I think that's the important thing, and it doesn't become, you know, the Neil Forrester plan. Uh, it becomes the county, the club plan. So it's uh, it's good. It's good to to have a have someone in there to help that. How have you found it, Gareth? Have you found that you know having someone in to facilitate helps, or do you think there's a better work can be done before a facilitator comes in? Yeah, I think no. Like it's def- probably definitely more beneficial with a facilitator there. But in saying that, I found through COVID um, and just with not being able to meet people and some clubs not willing to get people online or different things, you know, a club filling it out themselves and, and coming back to you with all the information and, you know, we can then sort of feed back to them and, and then have your meeting with the coaches, you know. So it's probably just depending on probably the person in the club who's who's leading it. You know, if the right person's leading it, they'll probably pull the similar enough info. Yeah. But it definitely gets the ball rolling if they can get it if they can get started on their own. And I suppose the thing is, you know, if we can get our club to be self sufficient in this and, and then they come to us to help with the reviews and that sort of stuff is probably where we'd like to eventually get to. Yeah. yeah. And bearing in mind personnel and clubs change over as well, you know, so it's it's the sort of thing it's a bit like that session I said we ran in, in Mahara back in two thousand and two. You know, and I think we took our eye off the ball after a while around that whole area of fundamentals because um, we thought, ah, oh, we've done that now and, and the coaches the coaches uh, have got it all. But what happens five, ten years down the line is a different group of coaches. It's all the, the new parents that are coming in. So you always have to keep revisiting. And um, I think that that's important as well. That we, we, we do that's the nature of, of the organisation that we work in. Volunteers keep changing. Yeah, definitely. And look, we're very lucky in this county that we have some of the best coaching officers within the province and a lot of them have been in for the long haul. So um, we're very grateful for that and, and real good people. So um, that's that's definitely a strength. Look, I think that's that's us. Um, hopefully people got something out of that. To say I'm going to share this um, meeting with the resources online um, over the next couple of weeks. If people... Do you want to start the ball rolling within your club? Um, you know, within the next few months, don't be afraid to get in touch. Ideally, I would think that most clubs will will try and get their coaches up to speed now, um, provide them with the tools to to get out onto the pitch, and then maybe have a stab at this towards the back end of the season. Um, and September time would would be perfect. So, uh, whatever you need, don't be afraid to shout. And just on behalf of Derry. Big thanks to Gareth and Eugene for coming on tonight um, from Ulster GA and of course Neil Forrester from the city. You can see how passionate Neil is about Stillstown and, and all that's going on within the city. So um, we're, we're grateful to have you all on board tonight and thanks for your contributions. All right. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, man. Cheers, Chris. All right.